Have you ever murdered anyone? Or perhaps you'd rather not say. Well, whether you have or not, you will appreciate this. That one of the major problems that confronts a murderer is what you do with the body. But for the man who strangled his wife in London on the Christmas Eve of 1941, that question, what to do with her afterwards, it wasn't so difficult. You see, there were any number of bodies being discovered around that time. The bodies of people who were victims of the Nazi bombs. And so, when the German bombers departed and the sirens moaned the all clear, somewhere in London was a man who walked the streets feeling reasonably safe. Safe because somewhere beneath one of the mounds of rubble lay the body of a woman, a woman he had murdered. It'll be months before they find her, he thought, and he was right. It was over two years before the body of a woman was discovered in the cellar of a bombed out schoolhouse in Islington. Hey, what's that? Come and have a look at this. Blimey, looks like a skeleton or something. It's a skeleton, all right. Must have happened when the bomb fell. You better get the police. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the murderer always overlooks something, or nearly always anyway. And there was one thing that this particular murderer overlooked. He overlooked the fact that every bomb victim was subjected to a very careful medical examination. The cause of death had to be determined in order to make quite sure whether the murderer was one Adolf Hitler or whether it was murder by a person or persons unknown. After the police pathologist had made his report to the coroner, the incomplete remains were removed to the Department of Forensic Medicine at Charing Cross Hospital. In charge of the case, Superintendent Henley of Scotland Yard waited to hear the pathologist's report. Well? Well, there's not very much to go on. She remains were a woman all right, and there's been some burning, and as far as it's possible to judge, I'd say she must have died about two years ago. You said something about a fractured bone. Yes, what's left of the larynx has been fractured. Only a very tiny fracture, but in forensic medicine, it's one of the most significant facts that can come to light. Meaning that she was strangled? Exactly. Is there any chance that the fractured larynx could be the result of a bomb injury? Mm, not a chance. Is there any evidence of identity? Anything we can start work on? A few details I can give you now. The woman was aged between 40 to 45. Height? Five foot, maybe five foot one. Lower jaw is missing, but in the upper jaw she'd worn a dental plate. There's no plate, but I'd say it contains seven false teeth. The four remaining teeth have fillings. Oh, and on the back of her skull I found traces of hair. As you see, there are only a few strands, but it's enough to be able to say that her hair was brown and it was going grey. Mm. Is that all? <laughs> There's quite a lot to have found out about a two-year-old skeleton. Perhaps you'd like the job of trying to find out who she is. I get on better with dead people. Yes. Well. I'll send you my report in the morning. Right. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Yes. The superintendent was right, though. It wasn't much to go on. All that he knew about the dead woman was. She was aged about 40 to 50, approximately five feet tall, her hair was brown, going grey. She had worn a dental plate and had fillings in four upper teeth. Pretty vague, wasn't it? But it's from such scanty beginnings that cases are built up. And the first step in the present instance, obviously, it was to identify the woman. But that was much easier said than done. Somewhere in wartime London, with its constantly shifting population of 10 million. One missing person had to be identified. One missing person. And the description so far, it might have fitted thousands.
From the missing persons registry, several hundred likely descriptions were selected. Then the order went out from Scotland Yard. Urgent. Ascertain identity of woman. Missing, believed, murdered. Description as follows. Age, 40 to 45. For weeks, Height, men of the criminal investigation five, department followed up every possible clue to the woman's identity. Many missing persons were found alive and well in this concentrated search. Many others appeared to fit the description of the dead woman until closer inquiry revealed one wrong piece in the complicated jigsaw of information. Yes, I did quite a lot of bridge work on that woman, but she can't be the one you're looking for. Why not? Well, you're looking for a woman who had four teeth in her upper jaw. That's right. Well, that woman had all her teeth removed five years ago. Sorry. Right. But steady, routine investigation was gradually narrowing down the field. Until after many more weeks of checking, questioning, and rechecking, the original list of likely victims was reduced to one. One very strong possibility. Elizabeth Drayton. Does everything check? Everything. Height, age, color of hair. Who have you talked to? Her sister. She reported her missing December the 29th, 1941. Anyone else? There's a husband somewhere, but we haven't found him yet. And how about the teeth? Did you check up on that? The dentist confirms that he fitted her with a plate containing seven teeth and put some fillings in the upper jaw. He's coming to the path lab this afternoon to see if he can identify the jaw. Oh, what time? Five o'clock. Well, fine, I'll come with you. This case has been hanging around long enough. Maybe this is where we start to crack it. Yes, uh, I think I can say those are my fillings all right. I can usually recognize my own work. Well, mind you, I, I wouldn't like to swear to it. You say you remember fitting her with a dental plate? Well, I gave this gentleman here a record of the work I did. Yes, that's right. Here it is. Uh, that's a sketch I made of the jaw. Always do that, you know. I believe in being methodical. It checks exactly. It's undoubtedly the same woman. Mm. Uh, Mr... Taylor. Mr. Taylor. I'd like you, if you wouldn't mind, to uh, have a look at this photograph. Why, yes, that's her. That's Mrs. Drayton, all right. The picture was clearer now. The murdered woman had at last been given a face. She had been given a name. It had taken the Criminal Investigation Department some time to identify the woman, but this was only the beginning. Their real job was to find the murderer. The first person to be interviewed along this line of inquiry was the husband, Charles Drayton. He had taken a little finding, but Scotland Yard finally tracked him down. He didn't have much to say, and as for his wife... Well, I don't know where she is. What's more, I don't very much care, either. She's been found dead, Mr. Drayton. Dead? Oh, accident? It doesn't appear to have been an accident. Oh. Exactly when was it you last saw your wife, Mr. Drayton? Oh, about two years ago. Uh, Christmas it was. I, I met her in the street. You mean you just ran into her? Uh, yes, 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 that's it. Did you talk to her? Yes, I talked to her. What about? Oh, well, well she kept on going on and on and on. About one thing and another. I didn't want no argument in the street, see, so I, well, I took her into a cafe and uh, bought her a cup of tea. What was the argument about? Well, it wasn't really an argument. Uh, she just kept on going on and on about being ill, about having no money and no one to look after her. I got fed up with this and told her I was going. She said she was coming with me, but uh, I wasn't having any. And then I told her that she ought to be getting home with her. air raids and a blackout and I gave her half a dollar and well, it was all I had and then we left the cafe.
Well, where did you go then? Well, I saw her on a bus for Stepney, and that was the last time I saw her. It's true, isn't it, that you haven't paid her any regular maintenance money since the last day you saw her? Well, I've paid her what I could. And because of this, in 1938, you were sentenced to a term of imprisonment. Well, I told you I've paid her what I could. Did she ever threaten to take you to court again over this maintenance business? No. According to the records of Old Street Police Station, where you made these payments from time to time, as from the day she was reported missing, you began making regular payments of the full amount as ordered by the court. How do you account for that? Well, I didn't know she was missing. That isn't exactly the point, Mr. Drayton. She was found in the cellar of a bombed-out school in Islington, in Chester Street. Do you know it? No. Can't say I do. Was it a place she was in the habit of visiting? No, never. You seem very certain. Well, I... Uh... Because you say you hardly ever saw her, how do you know whether she went there or not? Now, look here, if you're trying to pin this murder on me... Now, nobody said your wife had been murdered, Mr. Drayton. Well, thank you, Mr. Drayton. But, but, uh, but uh... look here. Here, but here. Well, sir, what do you think? It looks like it, doesn't it? That slip about his wife being murdered. Yes. Probably nagged him about money and one thing and another. Well, my wife's always nagging me about money, but I haven't murdered her yet. <laughs> no, we'll need a lot more than that to go on before we can pull him in. It's this school that bothers me. How on earth did she get there? And why there? Why pick on that place? There must have been hundreds of other bomb buildings around there. It may have been convenient. But that's just it. Convenient to where? It's quite away from his place, and it's miles from where she was living. You know, I've got a feeling we ought to go around there again and have another word with that caretaker chap. Never across that cafe and keep an eye on our friend. Very good, sir. All right, Smith, you know where the school is? Yes, sir. Let's hope that caretaker's got a good memory. Two years ago, you say she died? Yes, around about December. We were wondering if you could tell us anything at all unusual that might have happened round about that time. Unusual? It's all right, I'll do that. Well, we hit and dropped a bomb on the school one night, but don't think there was anything unusual about that. Did you see anyone hanging around the school? Anyone you didn't know? No. Because after the bomb, we had a lot of kids playing around the back. You come to think of it, it was probably those kids what started the fire. Fire? What fire was that? Oh, just a little blaze we had in the cellar one night. An incendiary? Oh, no, nothing like that. But it's my belief somebody started it on purpose. Didn't you report it? Oh, dear me, yes. Well, we had fire brigades and everything here. You better check up on that. Can you remember the date? Of course I can. It was Christmas, Christmas Eve. It was rather strange, now I come to think of it. There was no air raid that night. Who discovered the fire? Well, the fire watcher discovered it. He was on duty in the schoolroom over the cellar. He said he saw smoke coming through the floor. When he went down in the cellar, he found an old straw mattress torn up and set alight. He tried to get it out himself, but it got beyond control, so he called the fire engines. Mark here, it was an hour before he got round to calling them. An hour? Yeah. Did he tell you why he waited all that time before giving the alarm? Well, he said he was trying to get the fire under control. Look, if you really want to know what happened, why don't you ask him yourself? We will. Do you know where he lives? No, but I know his name. Charlie something. Charlie Drayton. That's right, Charles Drayton. Get a squad car around there right away and pick him up. We'll meet you there. Right. All right. So she did go with him to the school. Yeah, that's what it looks like. He went off to do a spot of fire watching and she went with him. I don't suppose we'll ever know what really happened. But the chances are she started nagging him again. Only by this time she was beginning to get on Drayton's nerves. Perhaps she threatened him with the police again. At any rate, she must have said something that really got out of his skin. Get out! Go on, get out! Get out and leave me alone! 
Don't you raise your voice to me, Charles Drayton. Do more than raise my voice to you in a minute. I told you, get out! This is your last chance, Charles. Either you pay me my money regular, or I'll go to the police again. Do you know what happened last time? Yes, you'd like that, wouldn't you? I wouldn't, Charles, you know that. But I've got to have my money. I've got to live, Charles. I've got to live. You're going or aren't you? No, Charles. Right. Keep away from me. Charles, what's the matter if you go there? Something. actually planned to kill her, or whether it was something that happened in a moment of rage, I don't know. At any rate, the deed was done, and his first thoughts must have been how to get rid of the body. And, of course, the most obvious place was the cellar beneath the school. He tried to burn the body, but failed. Then, in desperation, he hid it beneath the cellar floor, hoping that if it ever was discovered, it might be thought to be a bomb victim. Then, in case anybody had seen the blaze, he telephoned the fire brigade. Here we are. Drayton's gone, sir. No one seems to know where he is. He packed his bags and went. Is Sergeant Thompson here? I haven't seen him anywhere, sir. Well, Drayton won't get far. Not with Thompson on his tail. Mind that blackout. Looks like it's the docks again tonight. It's a bit ironical, isn't it? What? Well, here we are doing everything we can to bring a murderer to justice. While out there, people are getting killed off by the score. It seems a bit incongruous. Don't worry. The law will catch up with them eventually. I hope so. Right. Henry speaking. What? Charing Cross Underground Station. I lost him in the car, but he won't get far. There's an alert on, and the tunnel under the river's been closed, so there are no trains running. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. He's at Charing Cross Underground. Get me the information room, but well, that's about as far as he's going to get. Hello, Henry speaking. Have all available cars in the vicinity go to Charing Cross Underground immediately. Contact Sergeant Thompson on arrival. Right. Come on. Within a matter of seconds, every patrol car in the area had converged on the underground station. Meanwhile, somewhere below the ground was the wanted man, Charles Drayton. Where exactly he was making for in that mad last minute dash, nobody's ever found out. But wherever he thought he was going, he never got any further on the platform of Charing Cross Underground. Here, let me through. Let me through, Coach. No more trains still after the air, Aiden, mate. They've closed the tunnel under the river. Yeah, but I've got to get to walk to Lou. You'll have to go upstairs and walk in. All change here. All change. emergency exit. Yes, two of our men are behind him.
gracioso. Charles Drayton was tried at the Old Bailey, and he was found guilty of murder. Although he never confessed to the crime, the evidence against him was quite overwhelming. And on September the 20th, 1944, he paid the supreme penalty. As to the real reason why he murdered his wife, well, everything seems to indicate that he did it simply to avoid paying her maintenance money. One pound a week. Any other way out of his dilemma never seems to have crossed his mind. But Charles Drayton wasn't a very intelligent man. But then murder isn't a very intelligent act.